Hello there. To regain power as quickly as possible, Labour and the unions now know what they have to do. Firstly, please subscribe and like this video to give my channel a boost. And I'm always uploading new content, so please do check back daily. Now after the last election and that thumping Tory win, the universal opinion was that the Labour Party would be wandering the political wilderness for a generation. But then came the invisible enemy. And at first it looked like the Tories were secure in their position and that Labour was making itself into an irrelevance. Even now Boris and his team are flying in the polls. But behind the immediate political successes there lies a seriously failing economy being brought down by that invisible enemy. And that is what the momentum-backed Labour Party and the unions will try to exploit. And the worse the economic situation gets, the better it is for them. And this also applies to the Labour administration in Wales and the SNP in Scotland, of course. And the true horror of the public finances will not become apparent for another couple of months. Especially with the news out today that one in three small businesses may never reopen their doors again. And already the economic indicators look dire, with the initial figures from the ONS showing that the UK economy shrank by 2% in the first quarter of the year. And remember, for much of that we were not in lockdown. In fact, many people went on a spending spree buying toilet rolls, if you remember. This quarterly fall is the largest since the fourth quarter of 2008, after the credit crunch had hit. But the ONS has also published a report on the effects of the invisible enemy on the UK economy in March. And that shows that the economy nosedived by a full 5.8%. This, says the ONS, is the largest fall since monthly records began in 1997, reflecting record widespread falls in services, production and construction output. And the rest of the report makes for equally grim reading. Not only that, but HMRC reports that VAT receipts alone fell by £5.6 billion when compared to March last year, from £7.9 billion to £2.3 billion. And The Telegraph today says that the Treasury has now ditched the initial optimistic V-shaped economic recovery prognosis and is now seriously looking at across-the-board tax rises to pay for the invisible enemy fallout. Now, one of the Tory pledges on coming into government was that it would not raise the headline rates of income tax, national insurance or VAT. But according to the Telegraph, the Chancellor has been advised that it will be economically better to break the tax lock to achieve revenue of this scale than attempt to raise this level of revenue without this constraint. And the pension triple lock that protects the state pension against the ravages of inflation could also be under threat. Now that would be raw red meat for Keir Starmer and his Labour Party. You lent your vote to the Blues, they would say. They asked you to do this thing and look at how they reward you. Then there'd be all the normal talk about the protected wealthy, etc. Oh, and how about the prospect of a two-year public sector pay freeze? And all of this is, of course, the dreaded A-word. The word that the Tories now fear so much. Austerity. More raw red meat for the Labour Party. But the danger for Labour and its union supporters is that the Tories might just manage to get the baton around the course quickly enough to stay ahead. Labour will therefore understand that in order to win the day, it will need to do its best to keep the country locked down for as long as possible. It will need to play the coronaphobia card for all that it is worth. 
And this is where the government's own project fear to keep us all locked down will pay dividends for Labour. So many people say they are now terrified of leaving their homes that it will take an almighty effort to lever them out the front door for any extended period. Unless it's for fun, fitness and sunbathing, of course, then quite a few seem willing to chance their arm. However, Labour will want to see the national debt driven up to force the Tories to start talking about tax rises and the like, so that the austerity word can be brought back into play with a vengeance. And what better way to do this than a national strike? But not a national strike in the normal sense, where discontented workers withdraw their labour, but one where workers are encouraged to continue not working, using health concerns as the driver. Just watch as Labour and the unions now push this fear as far as it will go, even if it goes against scientific advice. And here's a Corbyn tweet sent a couple of days ago to show the sort of thinking I'm talking about. Today I challenge Boris Johnson on how this crisis has exposed grotesque levels of inequality and vulnerability. Now he has given unscrupulous employers carte blanche to force people back to work when it is not safe, putting more lives in danger. People must come before profit. What he's trying to make out is that the government is willfully putting people in danger when what it's trying to do is get people safely back to work so that they can pay the taxes required to keep the NHS funded. And unscrupulous employers, eh? I'll just leave a reminder of what happened in the run-up to Christmas. According to Politics Home, Labour Party staff have been warned they face losing their jobs just days before Christmas following the party's heavy election defeat. Remember that one? While Corbyn led the Labour Party? Anyway, it cannot have failed to have crossed the minds of Labour and Union bigwigs that as long as they appear to be supporting all moves to combat the invisible enemy, they could also use it to undermine the government without looking like they're playing party politics with it. All they would have to do is play their health card at every available opportunity, use it to slow the return to work and the recovery down. Demand cast-iron guarantees of safety from bosses and Tory politicians, guarantees that could never be given. Keep the workers worried about going back to work. And this is helped along by Rishi Sunak's announcement yesterday that the government-funded furlough scheme will keep running until October, albeit with some limited tapering off now factored in. But what when we get to the stage of employers having to choose between starting to pay for what would be, given the economic conditions we face, a potentially unproductive workforce, instead of the taxpayer picking up the bill? That could trigger a wave of layoffs as companies slim down workforces to meet the real demand. Greedy employers in the firing line. More raw red meat for labour. And while the Tories would be asking employers to play the game, in public, labour and the unions would be wringing their hands over lost jobs, while behind closed doors licking their lips and plotting and the unions would no doubt be looking at industrial action. Already the unions are telling the teachers not to even engage with plans to open schools. When the scientific advice is that schools should open again, then those concerned from teacher to parent should do all in their power to make it happen, not put obstacles in the way. But sadly, it looks like this is now the battleground of the day, playing politics with children's education. Look at what supermarkets have done. Look at how delivery drivers have changed their practices. Look at what other key workers have done. And while our children are not going to school, they will be left behind in educational terms compared to all the countries where their schools have successfully reopened. The only upside to that 
is that the children will have been free of the ultra-left-wing aspect of UK education for a few months. But doubtless the BBC will do all it can to bridge that gap. Labour and the unions will push and push to try and get the country so debt-bound that even the NHS is strapped for cash so they can point fingers and say, there, I told you so. Labour needs an economy on the brink, where only a command economy type of response, like that seen after the Second World War, where only that will suffice to rescue us. A command economy where they, a potential Labour government, decides who works where and what they get paid, and who gets a pay rise and the promotions, and further, who gets what services in which area. A command economy where property and money can be commandeered and redistributed in the best communist fashion. A command economy where Labour would get us back inside the EU single market. In short, a momentum-led Labour Party dream situation for them. Communism on a plate. And a nightmare for the rest of us. And you don't think we might be headed there? Well... We may already need a huge government-led command economy drive to dig us out of the current hole. As private companies lay off staff, the government will need to initiate all sorts of routes to employment by spending hugely, yet more debt to pay off. But under the Tories, one would hope the initiatives would be positive for the economy in the long run. Whereas under a communist setup. You just pay one set of people to dig a hole and another set to come along and fill the hole in. So the question might turn out to be, who would you prefer to be leading such a command economy? The Tories or Labour? Anyway, if you want to hear more from me, please don't forget to subscribe and also press that little bell or you won't get any notifications. And if you want to see more of me, Buy a mug with my mug on it. So, what do you think Labour and the SNP will do? Support the country going back to work? Or try and derail it? Please share and comment. And thank you for watching.